in 2009, I was on a plane flight to Dallas, Fort Worth from San Jose, California. This is not uncommon for me. I am permanent platinum on American Airlines with more than three million miles. And sitting next to me was a remarkable person, Kim Willesh. Kim is the head of economic development of the city of San Jose. And of course, she was telling me about the city, and I was telling her about innovation games. I actually have a book with me, and I'm showing her what I do. And she's patiently listening to me babble. And in that conversation, there was a moment that happened. And I want you to think of those cool videos of high-speed natural phenomena, bullet time. And in that conversation, Kim told me that the city of San Jose was $100 million in debt. This is, two, yeah, whew. this is 2009. We are all dealing with the uh, recession. In that moment, I thought, OMG, uh, because I was channeling our MCs and thinking millennial thoughts. <laughs> and in that moment, I thought to myself, I have spent much of my career helping organizations prioritize features, prioritize backlogs, prioritize epics, prioritize technical debt. And I said to myself, I thought to myself, in that instant, I can help a city prioritize the budget. I can help. <laughs> and then I said it, and the moment I said it, I realized what I said. <laughs> and Kim, who is incredibly gracious again, thanks me for my idea and explains that Mayor Reed already does this. this he, Mayor Reed has a community-based budgeting process. And I think to myself, this is great. I'm an agilist. Agile values. I believe in customer collaboration over contract negotiation. This makes me super happy. So of course I say to Kim, Kim, can I come to the event? And she again is incredibly gracious and says, yes, you can come. So this is the best photo I have. January 23rd, 2010. You can see Kim is here and I'm here and we're walking around. And at the event, they presented a PowerPoint from the city manager, which kind of outlined things to do. And then they wanted the citizen feedback. So they gave everyone a roll of nickels and five glass jars and five spending priorities, very high level with nothing concrete. And they asked the citizens to deposit the nickels into the jars. This was a survey, the surveys suck. The smart citizens just pocketed the nickels. <laughs> now in truth, surveys don't suck. There are valid uses of surveys and if you take the Agile product and solution management, we'll uh, explore the use of surveys along with other market research techniques. But in this context, when you're dealing with a gripping crisis, and the opinions of other people really matter to you, surveys suck. So I met with Kim, and she said, what do you think of our event? And of course, I didn't say surveys suck. I said, I think we could do better. How about we make this collaborative? Now, at this point, the city is, in fact, uh, still massively in debt. So we have to kind of think about, well, what is collaboration, and, and would it be applicable? Well, to be collaborative, you have to have a goal, something to achieve. You need a mechanism to achieve the goal, some resources, and you need a place to do it, a field of interaction or a field of play. But to be collaborative, I, I need to know, well, how do I work with other people? I need some rules, I need some guidance, and I need to know how I'm doing. I need some mechanism of feedback. And curiously, I need the opportunity to make a choice. On this side of the line, I'm a completely rational human. And on this side of the line, 
I decide not to touch the ball with my hands. Standing here and I have a little white ball, I can be a completely rational person and just put it in the hole. Walking over here and paying a lot of money to do it, I can whack it with a stick. That was for Dean. <laughs> we have a lot of games. Many games. A serious game is merely a game that is designed for a primary purpose other than pure entertainment. And that means they are the ideal collaboration tool. Because when we think about true collaboration, it has all of those elements. We have a goal that we want to achieve. Meetings start with a time. Collaboration starts with a goal. And we want to take all of those elements and apply them and help our organizations be successful. There's lots of games. We have, for example, in innovation games, we have Product Box, which help us understand unmet needs. We have Remember the Future, which is a form of collaborative goal-driven planning. We have Spiderweb to help us understand the complex system relationships that exist. We have Start Your Day, which is one of my favorites. It helps us understand patterns of use. We have Speedboat or Sailboat. Some of you have used these in retrospectives. And we have, so we have lots of games. When you look at this, you start to realize, well, that none of these really met the criteria that the city had, which was financially oriented prioritization. But we do it by a feature. And then by a feature, we assemble five to eight participants. We have a list of items that we want to prioritize. We give them the budget distributed equally. So if my budget is 80 million, and I have eight participants, each participant would get 10 million. And we simply let them decide. You allocate your resources to the initiatives that you find most compelling. This is known as participatory budgeting, and it is, in fact, in safe, lean portfolio management. But let's go back to the city. The city's $100 million in debt. It doesn't sound very motivational to walk up to the citizens and say, here's some money, fund what you want, when the citizens already know they're in debt. So you have to put on your game designer hat, your game mod hat, and we decide to change the game. These are the funding proposals, the green sheets. But we added reduction proposals, the red sheets. And we printed special money for San Jose. And the rules of this new game were as follows. The facilitator presented the red sheets. If the table unanimously agreed, think about how hard that is. If the table had unanimous agreement on a red sheet item, the money associated with that item was distributed to the participants, which they could spend as they see fit. Now, when I'm working on my backlog with my Weave team. I agonize over what to do. And I know all of the product managers and product owners and solution managers and business leaders in this room, we agonize over our backlogs. But one of the things that's important to me about this work is it helps me keep that backlog in perspective. Because this is what citizens of San Jose were agonizing over. Do we want to fund any graffiti which we know helps Defeat gang violence, which is something that is problems or a problem in San Jose? Or would we rather fund the Children's Health Initiative? And what about park rangers? Park rangers are proven to keep the city safer. Well, how would I do that? How do I fund that? Well, I could eliminate the police helicopter, but, but would that affect safety? Or I could reduce the number of people in the fire truck from five to four? That saves a lot of money, but... What happens if there's a fire? It, are we going to be harmed? These are really substantive issues, but this is what the city had to deal with to get out of that debt. So we assembled a team of facilitators. All of these people gave their time pro bono. They were drawn from my friends in the Agile community. They were also drawn voluntarily from, uh, from companies who have headquarters in San Jose. People like Cisco or Adobe, 
because companies are starting to realize if our cities fail, our companies fail. We have to help them be successful. Here was one facilitator, Brett McKellen. Now, the facilitators were not there to guide the decisions, but to help facilitate the process. The participants were the neighborhood association leaders and youth commission leaders. So the city of San Jose, for uh, this is common in America, but for, for all of our international guests, the city of San Jose is organized into 10 districts. Each district has a set of neighborhood associations. And we knew that those people were active in the city, often very knowledgeable about the city structure. We invited them to come. Now, subject matter experts like Fire Chief William McDonald answered questions. We did a very sophisticated signaling mechanism, a red plate taped to a stick. When we had a table question, we'd raise it. And the appropriate subject matter expert would come and answer it. Fire Chief McDonald, what would happen if we lowered the number of people in the fire truck from five to four? Is it legal to do that? Are there like laws that ask us how many people have to be in the fire truck, et cetera, et cetera? We went through this process. When we were done with separate tables, multiple separate tables, we found that San Jose residents, they chose pavement maintenance over libraries. So I send my results to the mayor. Mayor Reed calls me up. Luke, are these results valid? Yes, Mayor Reed. We've triple checked them. These are, these are results you can act on. Well, they're remarkable. They're radical. I'm a, I'm a researcher. It's hard to, for me to think of something as radical because I'm looking at data. I said, really, Mayor Reed, why is this radical? He said, Luke, San Jose needs improvements in maintenance. But if I were to go publicly and say pavement maintenance was more important than the libraries, the friends of libraries would come out in force and skewer me in the paper. And there's no friends of pavement. <laughs> he said, do you understand? And I said, kind of. I'm in IT. There's no friends of infrastructure. Research is nice, impact is better. This was the start of a multi-month process. And through the budgeting process, which starts in January in San Jose and ends in June, we were able to contribute. They did, in fact, make reductions in the fire department. They did, in fact, make reductions in the police department. They reordered the sequencing of libraries and they changed some services. What we learned in that process it was very exciting. We learned that you can, in fact, use agile collaboration tools for a much larger purpose. And I started to think about what that was, and I started to get this idea of an awesome super problem. I'll come back to that. Now, being an agilist, we baked in a retrospective, real time at the event. And it was profound. A woman who came to the event from a clearly economically disadvantaged part of San Jose falteringly took the microphone and said, I've been to this event for a few years, and this was the first time I had the same amount of money to make the same impact as everyone else. Think about what she said. We all have the same vote in our democracy. But she knew that when we hit the budget, when we hit the money, she had the same impact as everyone else. It was very gripping. Now, there was a lot of other parts of that feedback. This was great. We love it. We did it. Can we do it again? What about a sales tax? What, instead of just cutting, could we increase revenue? And, of course, the city, at this point, trusted the process. And they said, well, let's try it again. Let's do it in 2012. We added an option for new taxes. We made the process more sophisticated where we gave them options. You could buy this one or this one. We let them add their own ideas, the writing candidates. And this time we video it, videoed it. So let's see what happened 
in 2012. Can we roll the video? This is a kickoff of a six month long process of developing a budget for the city of San Jose. And we've been doing this uh, since I became mayor as part of our community based budgeting process. We've got uh, many of our key staff here uh, who are also very interested in hearing your questions, the discussion, and taking uh, that as uh, inputs as, as the city manager puts together her proposed uh, budget. The goal of this session is to understand your priorities, as Mayor Reed described, to spend on the proposals that are in the green paper. The facilitators at the table will help you manage the process. They will handle the distribution of the money to you. But if you buy an item, or if you want to fund a proposal, you must, as a table, give the money back to the facilitator. So it's like you're spending real money. First time, or my experience of it was very positive. I was um, in the, engaged in the conversation around the table, watching the participants to the degree that they were willing to put forward their ideas, articulate their rationale for them. But in the final analysis, was what they were willing to 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 negotiate and interact with one another and come to a consensus position. Uh, and I was surprised how quickly that happened with respect to the priorities, because I was expecting some people to be binary in terms of something that I consider trivial. But for the most part, it was, I was surprised the level of agreement that came across that. So in this uh, particular session, uh, there was another story that's worth sharing. Uh, the youth voices being present were pretty important. And one of the tables, there was a, a set of adults, one youth, and of course the youth has equal money, right? Part of the construction of this is that everyone has the same amount of resources or the same money. And the adults are kind of dominating the conversation and they're buying, you know, parks and things like that. And finally, the facilitator said to the youth, um, you know, you have the same amount of money, we want you to participate. And uh, she said, okay, um, well, I know all this park stuff is really important and you know, you guys are doing adult stuff, but if I wear the wrong color clothing on my way to school, I could get shot or beaten up. So I really think we need to do this other gang initiative. And then the moms and the dads at the table start crying. <laughs> yes, we're laughing, but they're crying and then everything changes. And it's, it's that moment of the difference between a vote that we don't talk about and a collaboration which gives us the opportunity to understand different perspectives. Because when it's a shared economic resource, the opinions of others matter to you and they're important to you. Now, along this time, I wanted to see if I could expand this work and with my dear friend Martha Amram, who is a noted economist, we formed Every Voice Engaged Foundation. Some of you in the Agile community know Lisa Adkins, and she was in one of my master classes, and I was talking about this, and I said, we think we want to call it something like Every Voice Heard, and Lisa said, no, 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 you don't want to hear people, you want to engage them, you want every voice engaged. And it was brilliant breakthrough, and so I'm forever thankful to Lisa for giving us this opportunity. We kept going. In 2013, we moved to the rotunda with even more people. At that time, this had started to spread and we had people flying in from other states and even from Europe to learn this technique. 
So Jürgen de Smit in Belgium flew over, participated, brought it back to Belgium, and then he pointed out that we might do better if we had the same beverages <laughs> in American politics that they use in Belgium. And I, I'm partial to this. I want to give it a try. In 2014, the city said, we keep wanting to engage more people. This is great, but we have to pay for that room. And they said, what about the convention center? And I said, yeah, let's bring in 5,000 people. And then, of course, I realized what I said. And the city said, that's very nice, but we don't we have really the funds to, to fund the convention center for 5,000 people. Could you go online? And I said, well, indeed we can. We have a platform for this called Weave. And so we went online. And once we went online, we opened the possibility for more participation. We had facilitators from Sweden facilitating online collaborative forums for people in San Jose. Now, we had more than 3,500 chats. And the chats are important because we're not using video. So what did the San Jose residents think about this online experience? And what might that instruct us as we're dealing with our distributed organizations? David, interesting, and this is an unedited uh, chat. Interesting exercise. I've done it in person at City Hall once before, worked very similarly. Gene, this is better than the in-person game. Facilitator, what did you like about it more, Gene? Gene, not noisy, could hear everyone. Real-time updates of the balances. I could keep track of other people's values via the bids. No side chatter, better focus on task. David, it came down to the facts. No body language, no prejudices, just ideas in dealing. A few years ago, we were working with Cisco, and I'm in a meeting where we're going to go through a pretty tough budgeting process. And uh, the leader of this group is a wonderful man, really great guy, lo beloved by his team. And I said, well, how about we do this online? And that way, we don't have to worry about you know, body language and all that other stuff. And he says, oh, do you think that's going to affect us? And there was a snicker in, in the room. And I said, oh, and I'll just say the word John. It's not his real name. But I said, John, could you just stand up? Well, six foot eight, 290 pound, bald with tattoos, John stands up. And I said, John, do you think body language could affect the decision-making process <laughs> in the room? And he was, he was literally mortified because he is the nicest guy you'd ever meet. And yet, you can't overcome certain things. And so by going online, you can actually change the dynamic of the interaction. Now, this brings up some interesting points, right? Because some people in the larger and broader Agile community say all teams should be co-located. And there are certainly advantages to co-location. But curiously, these people say we need distributed teams to scale. Well, maybe this is one of those times where we should invoke our yes and in spite of dogma or a consultant's income. We've now been doing this for years. And what we found is that we can repeatedly use these techniques to engage citizens. And the city is making progress. The city is no longer 100 million in debt. It's not just these techniques, of course. It's a whole lot of work from a whole lot of people. But we're making progress. Eventually, though, the citizens got tired of cutting. And they said, could you help our city grow? I'm thinking to myself, well, yeah. That's like asking, how should our solution grow? How should our product evolve? How should we grow? And do we have techniques that could help a city grow? Well, I kind of think we do, because we can make things look the way we want when we're growing them. And we have an innovation game, prune the product tree. We represent the product or solution as a tree, and we talk about its growth. We look at the time horizons. We look at those features and capabilities that we want to add. We expose the roots so we can, in fact, talk about that nutritious infrastructure that helps those things grow and succeed. And we know that we can do this in person. 
You can model your agile transformation as growth. You can look at products. This tree is from Oracle when one of their solution and product managers was working on how their product and service would grow. And we can draw those trees any way we need to to accomplish our goal. We've even done this at Scaled Agile with some of our largest enterprise customers about how we can improve the safe learner subscription to better meet their needs. And as you can see, we can do this both in person and online. So in 2013, we also added the Great Neighborhoods Project where we engaged residents in how they could make their neighborhoods grow. We even repeated it in 2017. And notice that in 2013, we did both in person and online to engage as many people as we could. And in 2017, once again, we did this modality. And what we learned again is that we can use agile collaboration techniques to accomplish much bigger goals. Over time, the city is building trust in the residents' feedback. And up until now, it had been used as an advisory function. What if we pushed it? What if we invoked safe value? One of my personal favorites is decentralized decision making. What if we invoke that value? And we gave the money to the residents directly. Two years ago, we started the process and we changed it where we went to the districts and we gave money directly to the district. And the district created the ideas. The district formed those ideas into proposals. The district selected what was important with direct funding. Now, if you think about that, that is the embodiment of the diamond of design thinking. Ideation, divergent thinking, what would make our place better, our community better, shaping those into proposals, prioritizing them and then executing. And if you think about what we want for our children for the 21st century education initiatives, they're the four C's. We want to teach our children how to collaborate, how to be creative, how to engage critical thinking, how to communicate. Now, I have four wonderful kids. So we're at dinner, and I said, hey, everyone, I got an idea. And my wife says, okay, dad's got an idea. <laughs> Everyone's sitting down? And I said, let's take the process we're doing in San Jose and do it at Sunnyvale Middle School, where I had two kids at the time. I'm always like, oh, come on, really? You're going to give money to the kids? I said, yeah. What if they buy pizza? Well, then they buy pizza. They needed it social. I don't know. And then I look over the table. I said, Cress, he's my eighth grader. Cress, if you could make the school better, what would you do? One thing. Oh, Dad, that's easy. Kids like me who bring the lunch get stuck in the lunch line. We need a third lunch line that's just drinks. And that way, I could get my drink faster and go play. OK, and I'm thinking, this is cool. And I look at my wife, and she's like, fine. <laughs> fine. And, I'm th and then I said, by the way, Q theory, batch size, and, and workflow, operational engineering. <laughs> Just to put it out there, eighth grade. So I go to the PTA, and they're a little skeptical. So I said, fine, I'll write the check myself. Here's $500. One condition. The kids are in complete control. So going to the Weave platform, we created a map of the school. And each of the rooms in the homerooms, the beginning of the day, over a week generated ideas. Now, there were a few silly ones, like the pond or the half pipe, but there were some interesting ones. And that's OK, because it's ideation. And if we're not at least, you know, you're not doing safe if you're not having a little fun. That's my take. It shouldn't be all work. And the kids end up picking after they shape them into proposals, an LK water bottle refilling station to take out an old water fountain and put this one in so they could be more green. And all the adults agreed they would have never thought of it, nor would they have picked it. We did it again, and the kids chose a 3D printer 
for the art lab because they know mom and dad are doing this thing with 3D printing and it's kind of, what is it? Let's play with it. Now at this point, we have a very important question. Are you a monopoly butt? What happens when you land on free parking? Shout it out, someone shout it out. What happens when you land on free parking? You get the money, someone said you get the money. Is that, you start the game with like $500 or you, the bank, you get the money. Is that what really happens in Monopoly according to the rules of Monopoly? No, what happens according to the rules? Nothing, nothing. I was like, oh, wow, I didn't want to come to this talk and learn the truth. <laughs> but what you did was you modified the game. Technically, if we get into game theory, what you did was you inflated the money supply and you extended the duration of the game. Monopoly is actually a pretty ruthless game. And if you play it according to the rules, it will be done in about 30 to 40 minutes. But what happens, I know people don't believe it, but it's true. But what happens, right, you, you play the rule like you can only buy or sell the property when you land on it. Actually, no, you can do that any time. So the, what happens is, is we inadvertently do things with the rules that inflate the money supply and extend the game. Now, Amy Cootie has done a lot of work on um, uh, self-image and body language, and that's important to me because I have kids, right? And she talks about if you're facing a difficult task or if you want to do something important, you can assume the superhero pose. So without realizing it, you are all game designers because you change games and you've modified Monopoly and you've done things. And this is important. So I want everyone to introduce each other in the following way. You're going to stand up, you put your hands on your hip, look up, chest high, and say, hello, my name is, and I am a game designer. Introduce yourself to someone. Now, curiously, humans have a lot of interesting relationships with games. We create things that are somewhat hard, but we continually evolve them, right? Our game of, okay, fine Europeans, football. <sighs> the game of football has evolved. And this year, we've got some new rules. Coaches can receive cards, accidental handball goals will not stand, and you cannot attack the players in the wall. And I know sometimes it can be a little challenging, but for me, this is arguably the best part about SAFE itself is that it evolves. We change the rules as we learn how to accomplish the goal more effectively, which leads us to ask ourselves, well, how far can we push these mods? If we've been taking these techniques that work in business and we can push them, how far can we push them? So before the event, we did uh, a trial of a school funding process using participatory budgeting, and you can see some proposals that were associated with what might go into a bond. And if you think about this, you're thinking very kind of, in a sense, like what are the economic return of these items? And when we go into participatory budgeting and we're funding our epics and our value streams, we're thinking very uh, values and economics driven. What if I change the problem? What if I say, how do we deal with school overcrowding? Well, now your brain thinks differently. Before you start thinking about how to spend money, the first thought is, what could I spend money on? How could I fix this? What are the strategies? And this is starting to introduce the distinction between a technical problem, things like budgets and roadmaps, which are clearly defined. They have shorter, year or less, or maybe two years or less, and often repeating time horizons. Failure really isn't catastrophic because if we're monitoring how we're doing, we have an opportunity to adjust, and they're very knowledge and economics driven. But when I'm dealing with the city of Los Altos, who is in fact running out of room for kids in schools, we're dealing with a wicked problem, which have very long-term horizons, and inertia keeps people doing the same thing. But that's a really dangerous thing, because in this case, failure is catastrophic. Those kids are coming. 
If they don't have a way to address it, they're not going to be able to go to school. And it's hard because there's almost always multiple actors, and these actors are not driving their decisions by economics. They're driving it by values and beliefs. And we have wicked problems at all levels of society, from school systems to here in California. We kind of still have a drought because the groundwater hasn't recovered. And nationally here in America, we have health care and immigration reform, which are pretty gnarly, wicked problems. Globally, IBM has said that 40% of our jobs are going to go away because of cognitive computing. We've got opioid crises. And as a father, it saddens me that the number one thing we export seems to be obesity for our children. Do we really want them to have shorter lives and less healthy lives than we have? I hope not. So we start to think about this. Do we have these wicked problems in business? Well, I think so. We still have late software, and we have massive technical doubt in some organizations. We have build or buy decisions, and then when we get to those challenging MVP choices, we have pivot, punt, or persevere. Wicked problems. Makes you go, oh. So you think, oh, well, we're business people, right? We can help. Just like I did the bullet time years ago. Well, maybe not. If you look at the research on the effectiveness of strategic decisions, uh, notably from Paul Nutt and a few other people, you'll find that 50% of strategic business decisions fail. Now, they don't fail because of the people. They fail because of the process. They fail because we don't create options we don't assess those actions, and we don't look for the drawbacks of what those actions would entail. And we don't deliberate. We have a small number of hippos who make the choice and cram it. We need to learn how to change this. So maybe we were looking the wrong way. Maybe there's something in the social sector that could help us. In 2012, I was giving a keynote at South by Southwest on fixing broken governments through collaboration games. And in the audience was Amy Lee from the Kettering Foundation. The Kettering Foundation is an institution that studies one thing, the function of democracy itself and how to improve its operation. And they've developed a technique known as a deliberative forum. And in a deliberative forum, a group of citizens will come together to address a wicked problem. They will look at a different strategy for attacking the problem associated with the strategy, they'll talk about their degree of support for actions and their willingness to accept the intrinsic drawback of the action itself. Now, let's apply this technique to the California drought. One strategy for dealing with the drought is to create or capture more water. We could drill, we could do all sorts of stuff. Another is to increase our conservation. Now, a third option, which is different than those two, is improve the governance of our water infrastructure, which is actually a patchwork quilt of laws across the state. Notice that two of these are in opposition. One, at least, is different. Now, for each of these strategies, there are actions we could take. We could, for example, build a desalination plant. We could change the levee system and we could build reservoirs. And as business people, these all sound appealing because we are action-oriented people. Yeah, let's take action. But hold on. Each of these has a fundamental, intrinsic drawback. If I build a desalination plant, eh, it's not that expensive in the scope of California budget. It's a billion. But it creates contaminated wastewater that we have to deal with. The levees, that sounds pretty good, except we've got a powerful agricultural economy in California, and if the levees are not done well, they could, in fact, hurt that. And reservoirs, well, they're actually more expensive than people think, and they save less water than people think. So these are tough options. So Kettering came to us and said, could you help us scale deliberation? So in collaboration, with the Kettering Foundation, we created Common Ground for Action, the world's first web-based scalable platform 
for deliberative decision making. And this is actually my choice for the strategy of creating and capturing more water. Notice it's very simple. I think we should. I'm conflicted. I think we should not. I think we should increase the production and use of recycled water. But the drawback is that the people who are against that call it toilet to tap. They try and scare people. You're not getting fresh water. You're getting recycled water toilet to tap. I'm an engineer. I kind of understand the shape of the water molecule. molecule. I'm good. So I can live with this. What happens in this process is that you are individually making your choices to set your opinion. But then we bring you together in the collaborative forum and you see a visualization of what everyone thinks and the facilitator starts talking about those choices. And in that dialogue, in that deliberation, if you change your mind, that picture will dynamically update in real time to reflect the emergence of where the group is headed. We repeat that process for every option and we create a picture of where there is a foundation for action against a complex, wicked problem. Now, it took me a while of working with Kettering. As a business person, you look at that and you go, wait, which one are we gonna do? And Kettering says, this is wonderful because these are value-based decisions. The first step for action is realizing that people who have a different point of view are not wrong or crazy. They just have a different point of view. And deliberation research shows that when you go through these forums, you soften your point of view and you start to look for what you can in fact do together. Now let's look at how we might apply this to technical debt, this process. One option is rewrite the code. One of the architects who worked for me, Ron Lundy, coined Lundy's Law. Lundy's Law says, given sufficient time, any team will justify a total rewrite. Now, the business people hear, oh, we have to do a total rewrite, and they're like, oh, those pesky developers, I'm going to skip them, and we're not even going to do software anymore, we're just going to buy it. I contend, though, that what you really need to do and should consider is better collaboration between the business and technology people. That's why in Safe 4.6 and now in Safe 5.0, the road mapping process is a collaborative event between the business and technology leaders, not a solo event on either side. So what we're starting to see is we can use tools used in the social sector in business, which means we can go full circle. There are a lot of powerful collaboration tools that can help us solve these problems. Which leads us to ask, what other problems can we tackle? Or more importantly, what other opportunities we can create? The Agile Manifesto says, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. The Agile Manifesto didn't say retrospect every iteration, or every, uh, it didn't say every sprint. It says regular intervals. And one of, uh, some of you will have used speedboat or sailboat as a retrospective technique in person. And Let's look at what happens when we res retrospect too frequently or not frequently enough. When we do a transformation, there's usually what I see is four phases of retrospectives. The first phase of the transformation is you see this early adoption and the teams really love retrospectives. They get a lot of value. What's actually happening is if those teams were reformed, what retrospectives do is they accelerate learning of how to work as a team. So a team is a shared transactional memory system. It's based on trust. And when I'm doing retrospectives, I start to learn how to work together. The second phase is when this team, who now knows how to work together, starts to improve their performance. It's a very exciting phase. But as our organizations scale, we hit the third phase, which is the organizational limits. The teams start to realize, wait, we're talking about impediments that we alone can't fix because it affects the other teams, the other teams in the art or the other teams in the solution train. And this is a very dangerous opportunity 
both danger and opportunity. Because if you keep going the same way, what's going to happen is those teams are going to stop retrospecting. They're going to say, why bother? Have you done the retrospective that takes 15 minutes? Yep, same things as we said last time. Let's go. But we can check the box, right? What we need to do now is we need to change that retrospective. We need to do enterprise retrospective because if we want to scale, we have to scale every practice, including retros. Now, the way we do this is we go online, and we'll do something like a sailboat retrospective. The anchors are slowing you down. The wind puffs make you go faster. And then we analyze it. This is for a company, B-Win Party. They're a real money gaming company. Gambling. They're a real money gambling, uh, uh, gaming company. And this was with 42 scrum teams. 42 scrum teams. 350 people. And what we found was that the teams were doing well, but there were, in fact, enterprise impediments that were affecting all of the teams. And so rather than looking for 30 local optimum of the teams, we found the two impediments across the enterprise that needed to be addressed by analyzing the data across all of the teams. Specifically, let me give you one of those impediments. Every team complained about the testing process for compliance. Now, if every team has an anchor about compliance, but you look at it on a, ter a per team basis, you may think, ah, oh, the teams are kvetching about compliance. Everyone, com everyone complains about compliance. But if 40 out of 42 teams use roughly the same language, our code basically works, and then we hand it to compliance for the final check, and we get all these errors, and then it's hard to figure out, you'd probably dig into it, right? If one team said it, if 40 out of 42 said it, so we dug into it. You know what we found? The compliance team installed the wrong version of Selenium. Oh, yeah, we've all had that. But we need that opportunity to see that at the enterprise level. I have a dream. San Jose is about a million one people. San Diego is a little bigger. I think it's about a million four. What if we could do a retrospective of the entire city? What would happen when, when companies die when they stop reflecting and improving? So do communities and so do cities. What if we took all of the power that we have as agilists and we applied it to our communities and our cities? Or maybe I'm going the wrong direction. What about the most important team of all time, our families? A few years ago, I was just blown away when a book was published by two family system therapists who had adopted and adapted innovation games in their practice. One of the games is 2020 Vision. And in this case, they're playing 2020 Vision with an alcoholic father and the family on priorities for recovery. Another game that I mentioned earlier was Remember the Future. They're playing Remember the Future on a family who has a member with a gambling addiction and how they're going to be successful. Really powerful stuff. Amazing stuff. So now what? Well, you might look at this and you might think, oh, that isn't me. That's like collaboration superhero stuff. But these are awesome super problems. And I now believe an awesome super problem is awesome as in inspiring and a super problem bigger than me, but we can solve it through collaboration. So... You might look at that picture and you think, okay, I'm not green, a god, the smartest engineer in the world, or genetically modified. <laughs> However, there's two people in that picture, a ballerina and a person with no fear, Hawkeye, no fear. Just like these people had no fear, agilists, business leaders, just like you, who were willing to donate a little time. So my request of you is to play two games to change the world. Now, you might be really inspired. You know, Inbar said, let's get inspired, right? So you're going to run back into the office and say, let's play. <laughs> and 
you may find yourself working in an environment where the boss says, we don't play games in this place. So I have to teach you how to overcome that. I'm going to teach you how to say, let's play a game in boss speak using the criteria of a game earlier. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. You're going to walk back into work and you say, boss, I want to engage my team in a goal-directed activity with clearly defined rules of engagement. Progress towards achievement of the goal will be tracked through clearly communicated status indicators. <laughs> oh, don't clap yet, because some of the people in the back who are not clapping are going, that's not good enough, Luke, because my boss is all about strategic. <laughs> and I'm working in a place that if we even laugh, they're going to be mad at me, so we can't have any hint of fun. It's an exercise. And we're supposed to be doing this agile thing, so help me out. I got you covered. You're going to call it an information radiator. <laughs> now you can clap. Or you could go back to work and say, what I'd really like to do is implement lean portfolio management and participatory budgeting and I'd like to engage our teams and their wisdom in this process. I gave this keynote at the EMEA Summit, and I'm so thankful that Dean and Chris and other leaders at the company allowed me to give this one again. Um, it's clearly very important to me. And at the EMEA Summit, Charlie Fleet, who gave the talk at Travelport yesterday, was there, and he took on, and the Travelport team took on the challenge. And he talked about that. So he, took the, he did the European Summit. One month later, he was implementing lean portfolio management. You could do growth like we have. How could you grow? Either way, what I'm looking for is for you to play a game. Now, if you do this, I'm in Silicon Valley. That's where I live. We get to have a curve that looks like this because every Silicon Valley company has to have a curve that looks like this. Or we could have something even more important. We could have a process that we use both at work and in our lives, in our families, in our communities that aligns with some of our most important values. I am asking you to play two games to change the world because the world needs you. Thank you. <laughs>